Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming outside me today. Today, we're talking with Andrew Downs from my great home state of Pennsylvania. But before we get to that, I want to remind you that if you would like to be part of the podcast, you would like to be part of the Average Jack Archery podcast and be just a part of the bow hunting and archery community from that average guy at home perspective, please send me an email at averagejackarchery at gmail.com. Hit me up on the social media platforms of Facebook and Instagram. Of course, you can always leave a comment on YouTube. But let's get to today's episode. Andrew is from the Pittsburgh general area of Pennsylvania, my favorite place in the world with the Penguins and the Steelers. But Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, this is a this is fun. I'm glad you decided to start this. I'm happy. I, I just like talking to other people just like me. This is this is my dream type of podcast, my type of content. It's fun to have the professionals on. We'll have definitely have some later down the road uh, on the podcast, but it's fun to talk to people because you guys are what I am. I just so happen to have the YouTube channel. So it it, it just works out for everybody. So folks, Andrew and I have uh, been talking obviously before the podcast, and kind of uh, sharing our, uh, swapping our stories about growing up in Pennsylvania, raising kids now in Pennsylvania, talking about our bow hunting experiences. And so real quick, uh, before I introduce Andrew's side of the thing, just to give you a little bit of my background, I have always stayed in Pennsylvania. I have predominantly hunted public land my entire life. Uh, and where I live in Pennsylvania, we are just loaded with public land. And so I've been bow hunting the mountains here in central PA for the better part of almost 17 years now. But Andrew, your experience is a little bit different. Why don't you go ahead and share that with everybody? Yeah, I started um, I started back when I was 20 some years ago when I was 12 years old. Started going out archery right away. I believe that was before crossbows were available. So this was the compound and as long as you could shoot it with uh, the legal limit, we we went out and yeah, I hunted from about 12 to 15 or so. And I got my first buck when I was 13 with a bow. So that was a great experience. Not a big buck, but it was, it was a fun, it's, you always remember the, the first buck. <laughs> yeah. A buck and in PA is a buck in PA too. Like people, people that live in the Midwest and have those ag corn fed, soybean fed deer just don't understand. <laughs> yeah especially this was back before any antler restrictions that we have now. So it was, if it had, what was it? Two or three inches or whatever was legal. Right <laughs> over a spike. Yeah. Yeah. Then it was legal to go after and people would. <laughs> so. Yeah. And are you guys are where you are currently? Actually, that's a good point. Are you guys in the three up four to a side zone? Yeah. My, my area right now is three up. So it does not count the brow time. It has to okay. be. Okay the three high so it's most likely an eight point if that's the case. right right yeah and for anybody listening who's unfamiliar pennsylvania for a long time had a uh, quite the decimated deer herd in terms of uh, older class deer and so it was probably but well over a decade ago probably yeah, almost almost there. yeah almost 15 years ago pennsylvania introduced antler restrictions and they're different for for certain parts of the state my area uh, you have to have three points, including the main beam, on one side of the head. So it could be a three-point, but it has to all be on one side. And uh, in Andrew's area, it's four up, almost ba or three up, not including the main beam. So basically, a four on one side. Um, so that's and that has, I think, at least in my experience, Andrew, you can chime in as well, has greatly increased the number of older class deer that I see on public and private. And when the seasons roll around, Facebook is just loaded with deer that look like they belong in Kansas, Iowa, Illinois. Yeah, it's, it's definitely helped a lot from what I've seen. Um, like I said, with my experience, it was from 12 to 15 or 16 was when I kind of gave up hunting for a while, just get involved in too many other activities, getting into high school and then college. But I've picked it up in the last few years since college. So I the antler restrictions came in during my downtime away, but my dad has hunted through the whole, like he's hunted for 40 years now. And I just remember as a kid, even before I hunted, it was, he would get a deer every year, but it would be a spike or a four point and getting a six point was a big deal back in the nineties. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now he has, he has a mount. I remember his, his first mount, he shot a buck in a local area and said he thought it was an eight point and it would have been his first eight point 
he came home, was let, giving it some time. He was all excited. And I made him, I was probably eight or nine at the time. And I was like, well, if it's an eight point, you have to get it mounted. And it comes back. It was an eight point. It's a smaller eight point. But yeah. It's like it's your first eight point. And he yeah. did get it mounted. <laughs> oh, good for him. Yeah. Bravo. Um, but since then, I mean, he's been getting, we've all been getting sixes and eights easily. You have to. So, and we've been seeing them. Right. But before you would just never see anything like that. Right. And, and uh, our mentored youth hunters and our youth hunters who are under the age of 12, um, actually, is it the 12 to 16 year olds too can still shoot a spike? It, it might be. I, I'm not I don't remember. Those, okay. But, uh, but definitely under the 12, our mentor hunters, uh, which is also new, that didn't exist when we were, we'll talk about that here in a second. But our mentor hunters who are under the age of 12, uh, who have to be hunting with a you know a parent or legal guardian with them in the woods? Uh, they can shoot still whatever they want. If they want to shoot a spike, if they want to shoot a little forky or something like that, they are welcome to do that. And let's actually talk about that because both you and I have uh, kids now, uh, and uh, you know they're still on the younger end. But when you and I were growing up through Pennsylvania, we couldn't hunt until we were 12 years old. That was the legal thing. You couldn't take your hunter safety course until you turned a certain part of 11, then you couldn't actually step foot in the woods with your own weapon until you were 12. But now in Pennsylvania, again, probably within the last decade, they've opened up this mentor hunting uh, where you as a parent legal guardian, someone over the age of 18 can actually give your tag to a mentored youth hunter under the age of 12. Um, so if, you know, my daughter, who's four, well, that's really young, but let's say next year she turns five and I take her out with the crossbow and she shoots a buck, she can take my buck tag or my doe tag or my turkey tag or something like that. Um, so I want to talk about, because your kid is six, right? Yeah, he'll be six in August here. So, oh, yeah. that's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So my question actually to you is because of that and knowing that I know I probably would have hunted if this rule had existed prior to, you know, when we were kids, I would have definitely been out in the woods hunting well before 12 years old. <laughs> Do you think you'll take your kiddo out or do you think you're still going to wait till he's seven, eight, maybe nine, can handle the bugs and the cold a little bit more? Yeah, it's, um, what's, it's a little tough there because I don't know what the right answer is. And I think it comes down to the individual kid because he enjoys going out. And last year I actually took him out, um, I think it was towards the end of archery or maybe the last day of archery. And we just had nice weather. It was a, I think it was mid fifties or low fifties around there. Real nice sunny evening. So I was like, well, let's go out. I took a ground blind out. We sat in there for a while, but my kind of a low chance of getting a deer, which is kind of what I was shooting for with a five-year-old last yeah. year. <laughs> um, but I set up on, just put the blind up on a gas line and a, I was very happy when I saw a doe step out 100 yards up the gas line. And then the doe comes down. Uh, so the doe came down right, uh, one, two does stepped out and one of them came down to within 20 yards or so till it noticed the blind. And then I'm like telling him to be quiet and he's loving it. And he, we're sitting still and he gets to experience the doe noticed our blind starts stomping at us and I was like telling him whispering to him what she's trying to do and he just had a blast with that and I think that's kind of what even what I might be shooting for this year get him out in some nice weather and see deer but even at six I'm not sure if he's ready for the after the shot experience yet <laughs> and I think that's the big thing that to worry about with kids <laughs> Right. And I think that's why a lot of folks uh, start out with the small game stuff. And I'm not a small game guy. Are you a small game guy? The squirrels and rabbits and stuff? I don't touch it personally. I, I did as a kid more. Um, I enjoy doing it just to mix something up, mix it up now a little bit because it can get a little old just sitting in tree stands a lot. But it's a different kind of hunting and I enjoy doing it, but I just I don't get the chance to anymore with just work and kids and you really only have time to focus on one thing <laughs> yeah I was you know and of course again this is the idea that you know we were we were um we were old enough to hunt by the time you turned 12 when we were kids you you were old enough to hunt deer so that's what my my grandfather was my mentor so he just threw me in here you go here's you know and I shot my first deer at 13 and that was an eye-opening experience because you don't oh, yeah. you don't grow up with that unless you actually follow and my granddad wasn't one to 
uh, you know, kind of let you fall in the woods kind of thing. You know, if you weren't going to be in the woods unless you were hunting. And so I didn't really see like, oh, now what we take care of after the shot, the processing the animal, the cleaning of yeah. the animal, the actual, the, the true work of the hunt. And so now I think it's a real benefit for kids to be able to experiment and see on that small game, see on squirrels and rabbits yeah. on a much smaller scale. Um, and even turkeys to an extent too, uh, in that, in that same vein, which I just, I really wish that I had been able to turkey hunt when I was like seven, eight, nine years old, because I yeah. now was almost 30. I just, I love every single moment of the turkey season. Um, yeah. Yeah, when I have the time for it, especially the spring there's, there's oh, no yeah. spring gobbler and getting them gobbling like crazy <laughs> gobbling like crazy the birds are singing it's getting green you know and, and for anybody who doesn't live in the northeast at least here in pennsylvania our our sp actual spring is like two weeks long it seems like we yeah. have like winter and then we have mud season where it's just cold <laughs> and muddy all the time and then we get like two weeks of green up and then it's summer it's like 80 degrees oh. and uh so that first two weeks or three weeks i mean this year our turkey season or at least last year, our turkey season, the opening day was like 37 degrees outside yeah, there the first week of May. Cold early. Yeah. yeah, it was brutal. So maybe maybe we can't take a six-year-old out in that type of weather. That's like the opening day of gun season. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think that's the biggest thing is, yeah, have decent weather and um, some snacks. And I know he was playing on my phone for a little while, but, yeah. but just get him to enjoy the outside. That's That's great. Yeah. So I want to circle back to you being able to get back outside. You know, mm -hmm. you, you had the hiatus there, high school sports and whatnot takes over, which is totally fine. And I, as I said before that we aired the, started on the air here, I didn't turkey hunt like all three years of college because, you know, I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. Well, heck, yeah. I'm up till three o'clock in the morning on Friday nights in college, you know, doing homework and this, that, and the other thing. So yeah, Saturday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Sa yeah. <laughs> Saturday mornings were very precious to me. I'm sleeping until one o'clock in the afternoon. So a lot of turkey hunting didn't happen. But you've now been able to, after college and, you know, raised your family, that sort of stuff, you're able to get back into the sport. Um, but what would you attest to getting back into it? Because there's a lot of people that are in your shoes. They started as a kid. They left for various and sundry reasons. Now they're in their 30s. They're in the 40s. They're even in their 50s. And now they're getting back into archery and getting back into bow hunting. What was, if you could pin it down to one catalyst, what was it that brought you back to the sport? Oh, man, just, I don't know, something to do on free time and weekends and just enjoying the outside. Um, I, I don't know, it's, especially Saturdays in the fall. I mean, I know that's a big college football time for a lot of people, but um, it depends which team you're following. So we had a few. My team had a few rough years. Pitt, <laughs> just, Pitt's had a few rough years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that goes back to when I was back in college. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, just getting enjoying the outside and just spending time. And I still go out with my dad a lot, and it's I enjoy spending time out there. Even though you joke about going out for deer hunting, it's you see each other at the parking lot, maybe walk in, split up, and I'm going to sit over here for three hours. You sit over there. See you then. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still time together and then getting back into it to, to get kids into it if they want to as well. Do you have the uh, ability to shoot uh, your bow in your backyard? I do. Yes. Yeah. That's a and big, that like how far can you get? I might be able to get 30 yards or so. Okay. Okay. See, that's that I find to be like the number one catalyst why people get back into bow hunting in particular is they actually can safely although I've been on some pretty sketchy things living in, in townhouses before when we were first married. Um, but they have the ability to shoot their bow because it's quiet. It's very safe. Um, and if you can get that 20, 30 yard distance, you have bow hunting. That's, that's bow hunting right there in terms of yeah, the distances. I, I'm, I mean, I, I probably, am, I don't feel comfortable shooting more than 30 yards at a deer anyways. It, and most of Pennsylvania, we're not going to get that kind of shot anyways, unless you're on a field. So we have a lot of thick woods, so they're going to be within 30 anyways. Right. Um, but yeah, it's that. And I guess with the um, restrictions here in Pennsylvania and being near Pittsburgh, near a major city with archery, you only need to be 50 yards from a house. 
and it's a little easier to find some pockets of woods whereas a gun you have to be 150 yards from a house which and when you fire a gun people know you're there yeah <laughs> Not, that's, uh, that's a great thing to, to point out. I'm not saying to sneak on to any private property or anything, but it's just, it's easier for smaller public areas or any parks and stuff where the general public might not even know you're there. Right. And I'll say too, that's, that's one of the things that I, you know, where I, now where I live is a very rural area. I kind of grew up in a much more suburban area, you know, my first, um, you know, 10 years here in PA, but archery hunting was a lot more well recepted well or well received you know in particular for access right i like i was surrounded by public land but there was a lot of places where walking through someone's backyard was quite advantageous and same thing true here and i found that if i knocked on a door and said hey you know and it's october weather's still nice but i'm shooting a bow i'm not in blaze orange uh you know uh, it's very quiet I don't, I don't drive a truck. I drive a, a little tiny Honda. So I didn't look like this, you know, I didn't have like big camo decals plaster all over my vehicle. Yeah. I got a lot of yeses in terms of access, right. And, and a lot of positive feedback. Do you find that's the case in particularly in, in a, in a city area where not everybody really hunts in a city. So, and it's not really right. well accepted. Do you find that you kind of get better accepted as a archery hunter and working in those kind of tighter areas than rather with a gun? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. And I think, I mean, that goes not to get into any of the nationwide debates or anything, but I just guns aren't as accepting anymore. I mean, people aren't educated on them. And I mean, your your compound bow isn't going to accidentally go off like people think a gun will. It takes some effort in that. So that's right. I don't know if it's just the uneducated people are uneducated on the topic and they, uh, yeah, they, they see a bow sitting there is more safe than a gun because yeah but yeah i agree you archery you're all camo at least here in pennsylvania you're all camo um you're not you don't stand out as rifle you need the orange hat orange vest <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's the uh what's the closest you've actually probably been to that 50 yard safety boundary i know that i've been 52 yards like that's <laughs> like i know i was able to range find the person's property Oh, uh, I haven't been that close. Okay. Uh, I've never, I never ranged a property. I was probably within a hundred though, but not quite 50. Okay. I, I full know. disclosure, I knew the person, like I knew that, like I could legally have hunted off their back porch, but I didn't want to cause a kerfuffle with the other people yeah. that lived in the neighborhood. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I just didn't know if you, if you like playing the edge, if you're like, no, it's, that's too I, uh, risky. Turkey, well, turkey season different, but I was on an area that's it's public but it's a frustrating area the public woods butt right up to an ag field and big open field and of course there's posted signs all on that and i've there's turkey always in it every time i see there hear them see them out there so i put my decoy one yard away from the posted sign and just hope i can lure one of them over <laughs> right <laughs> no luck with it there i think it's just a frustrating area yeah yeah <laughs> But it's, but it's true. Like a lot of people like hunting the boundaries, but it's a lot, it's, it is a lot easier with the archery equipment because I've shot some deer at like 175 yards, you know, with the firearm and I haven't heard anything, but inside I knew, oh, there's probably somebody in their house wondering right now, but with a bow at hundreds, even at 52 yards, you would have no idea that I was there. And that is so it's such a, a clean, quiet experience. Um, have you ever thought about the the whole crossbow thing in PA? Because I know, at least in my area, it caused quite a kerfuffle. So I, whenever I talk to another PA hunter, I have to get your input on this. And you say you hunt with your dad, too, and I don't know what his age is, but I know that um, my dad doesn't hunt, but my father-in-law does, and he just doesn't have the strength and the time, the energy to, to practice with the vertical bow, and the crossbow is the way he has to hunt. So I didn't know if if your dad has the same thoughts um, or if, uh, or if he's, if he's going to die yeah. with the vertical bow in his hand. Yeah. He's, he's mid sixties now. And okay. He's still, he's in good shape. He still comes out. He has his climbing tree stand and we still go out. He climbs and, uh, now he still shoots a compound bow. He still does well with it. And just this past year, he was talking about that when he gets a new bow, he's, uh, I think he's going to go with the crossbow. And, uh, 
I mean, I guess he's <laughs> he's getting up there, but I don't know. A lot of the people I talk to, it's it, if you're able and capable, use the compound. <laughs> yeah, I thought. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I have to agree. It's it's tough too because you know working in a shop. I meet a lot of people that are shooting a compound bow and I'll see them go down and they'll shoot, you know, we have a 20 yard indoor range and they can't hit a three inch group at 20 yards in perfect conditions, no wind. And they're like, ah, crossbows are terrible. I'm like, Oh, you should maybe think about shooting one. I guess that's the, <laughs> I guess that's the market for it, right? If you don't have the time to practice yeah. and whatnot, because it, it should work. The crossbow should still work. It's, You're right. Right. Yeah. Devin, do you with, think you do you think you would have your son though start with that because yeah. archery archery season it's warmer you have longer yeah. nights so on and so forth and it'd be easier to kind of get into that's what i've experienced a lot you know being a school teacher 10 11 12 year old kids a lot of them are starting off with that crossbow and archery season tagging out quote unquote and they don't even have to deal with well, you and i we had to go out that opening day of firearm season monday after thanksgiving we know it's raining sideways negative 20 you're freezing your butt off against a rock for hours now these kids have it easy they can go out with a crossbow right behind the house you know and and whack a doe first day of the season so what are your thoughts on that for the kids aspect yeah for the kids aspect i, I could see that to get him started but i would still as he gets older closer i don't even know the age but when he's able to start pulling back the 35 or 40 or whatever the minimum is, I would push for him to get there. It's, it's more of a, I think it's more of a challenge and I would, uh, I would like him to go that way. <laughs> yeah. I think we all, I think definitely we all would. If my daughters, you know, when they get to that point, they're like, I want to wait until I can hunt with a vertical bow. I want to be like daddy. I'll be like, yes. But if they want to hunt, and that, you know, their girlfriend at school shoots a crossbow with her dad or something. I'm not, I'll fork yeah. over the money for it, but I, I won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Some background on that. What you, this was, may have been in the 10 years ago or so as well, but before that in Pennsylvania, the crossbows were only for, was it handicapped and yeah. el- over a certain age, I believe? Yeah, senior. disabled over a certain age and maybe some military. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is probably the last 10, maybe 15 years they made crossbows legal for anybody. For everybody, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, it's been a big debate in the state. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now, shoot, I mean, they're adding Sunday hunting now, but well, wow. certain days. I mean, and that's just, I'm that is glorious. That. I'm all for that. <laughs> like, Penn, Penn, that's a whole other podcast in itself, but Pennsylvania needs to get on board with like 47 other states in this country. So yeah. it's nice I'm that we're glad. getting some. I'm glad at least we got what, one archery day, one rifle day, and then uh bear, I believe. A bear day, Bear's yeah, day. which is, I'm is glad at least the archery day is one of the November Sundays because we were discussing it when they said they were adding it. I'm like, you watch if they add that Sunday hunting in September or October, it's like that'll be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys uh are you south enough that you open up early? Like, are you in a WMU that opens up like that's because I'm in a, yeah. we don't open up till October. So do you guys open up in September? Yeah, I hunt multiple WMUs here. I live actually right on the Northern road. I'm like half a mile South of the Northern boundary <laughs> from two B to one A, I believe. So two B opens up two weeks early. So it's, it can be confusing on where I can hunt when sometimes, but so the, the area where I live opens up two weeks early, but if I go north or back home to hunt with my dad, that opens two weeks later with the rest of the state. And even there's some, the end of the season is different on those as well, I believe. It's yeah, they, they're they extended a little bit longer, I think, or something like that. And I for those of you... Right up until rifle season. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you that obviously aren't from PA... They open up areas in management units in Pennsylvania um, around cities, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Erie, the major ones with a lot of urban uh, deer populations. They open those up earlier. There's different regulations on how those areas work, um, but they open up earlier and keep them open later to allow more animal harvest so they have fewer vehicle collisions and, and yeah. that sort of stuff. A lot and, more a lot more doe tags available here too. Right. A lot more doe tags. And doe tags don't sell out all year. <laughs> No. And, and also you guys, until just this year, you guys even had the ability for, um, now the whole state does, but you guys had the ability to shoot one animal and stay in the stand and then continue to shoot 
multiple animals. Uh, we in the rest of the state, we would have to shoot one animal, get down, tag it, retrieve it. Then we could get back in the stand and continue to hunt, which is also an uncommon law across most of the country. Um, but now that's changed. Now the whole state can do that. So now I can, I can stay in the stand if I really want to, but um, not when it's 80 degrees outside. I need to save that venison. But, right. uh, but yeah, yeah. We're, well, we're starting to get on board. It doesn't, I don't do much early season hunting though. And it's partially because I haven't found any good areas where I can get their path down between food and bedding because that's all the early season is. And I just haven't found that yet. It's too hot. It's, it, I usually don't go out until middle of October anyways and kind of focus more of my time end of October into early November. Yeah, and do you, do, is that kind of common around your area? Because I know up here that the woods are packed from the opening day until the end of the The woods are just packed full of people. It, uh, it depends where you go. I think a lot of, I think it seems to be a lot of the newer hunters that, uh, go out as soon as they can. <laughs> but I, I just think I'll, I'll wear myself out. It's the archery is such a long season and I'll wear myself out in the hot weather and um, I don't know. I save that and saving the time of when I can get out. I'll save more vacation days and just save those couple weekends to go out later when it's nice, cool weather and more getting into the prime time rut action. Okay. Yeah. I'm one of the quote unquote new people. I'm out the very first day. Yeah, but I'm sure you go. <laughs> I've done it. I mean, I've, even two years ago, I did it to check out an area, but I, we, I use the early season. I don't scout too much in the summer, so I kind of use it as just armed scouting, I guess you would say. Carry a bow, check out some areas, and just see what's going on. Or do some uh, some spot sits and just see what you see. Like, I'll go to a new area, sit on a big ag field or something, and just see what's going on that night. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's something that I can agree with. I don't do much summer scouting either. It's just not... I, I quite frankly just don't need to go bitten by get bitten by ticks and mosquitoes and everything else, you know. Uh, <laughs> they don't scare me. I'm not worried about those. I'd rather be. I'm more worried about Lyme disease than anything else, because uh, I've found a few of those little buggers on me in my years. But yeah. um, uh, but the the summer scouting, I don't get too wound about it unless it's a really unique area that I just have to check out. Otherwise, I will do what you're doing and I will wait until the actual season. Because summer scouting's all well and good, but in particular, as you've described with this whole food to bed movement, that food to bed movement doesn't really start to solidify until it starts getting cooler. You know, right now in July, if it's 90 degrees like it, you know, it's going to be this week in particular, they're not moving at normal hours. They're not going to normal places. They need water. They need different type of browse. And then, of course, in the fall, when acorns start dropping, all hell breaks loose. Uh, in, in terms of what where they could be so yeah I agree with you on that one I don't I don't bugger with the heat and mosquitoes and ticks it's just not worth it but let's circle to because this is an archery podcast let's talk bow and arrow setup and you have sniffed the dust drank the kool-aid and you are you're headed off the the total arrow fairy dust fair yeah yeah you got the fairy dust you drank the cool <laughs> the ashby kool-aid you're going street legal whole bunch of stuff but I want to talk about first your bow, because this is something that I get messaged about a lot. People wanting to buy flagship level bows, people wanting to upgrade. I get a lot of upgrade questions, yeah. but you are not in the upgrade question category and you still yeah. put venison in your freezer. So tell yeah. me about tell me about your bow, because we talked about it here before we started this podcast and there is no shame. Do not <laughs> be ashamed of this bow. This bow is fantastic. Tell us about your bow. Tell us about your current arrow setup, what you're shooting, and then we'll talk about what you're planning on moving to coming for this fall. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you're showing video here or not, but I got an old high country here. I love the bow. This thing's probably 20 years old at least. Still shoots good. Maintain it. I think three, maybe four years ago, I got new strings and cables on it. So still shooting good and just doing upgrades. I have put a whisker biscuit on it last year, and I'm still using the old aluminum Easton XX75 2213s with the old fixed fixed three blade. And NAP Thunderheads, man. Yeah, I've been having luck with these, so yeah. 
And how but, many deer have you probably killed with that setup? Um, probably only only one with this setup. Okay. But, um, yeah, had uh, another one that didn't end very well. We ended up not being able to recover the deer. But yeah, it's uh, and that's what got me into the the ranch ferry and all his uh, the Dr. Ashby <laughs> in the last couple months here preaching more of a heavier arrow with higher FOC. And actually, I didn't even know what these were. I weighed it and with the broadhead, I think it's around 460, maybe 470 sure. total weight. And so I'm already kind of up there on weight. I just might need to move more of it towards the front and maybe a little bit more weight and see how that goes. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's something to, to look into for anybody. It's, there's a lot of tinkering and stuff you can do we discussed he does more of get your bow set up and then you can mess with the arrows after the fact but yeah i've been having having fun with this and still still get a hard time for the old aluminum arrows but which you shouldn't still, i know i enjoy it i take pride in hunting with the old stuff it works just as well yeah and it's kind of the it still works why why change it right, right. i mean easton the the old aluminum camo the camel hunters, Easton loved them so much and they have such a nostalgia for them that they made the FMJ with the camel. I mean, that's how much I, the, everybody yeah. loved the camel hunters. And this, you know, we'll, we have to touch on this because I don't think a lot of people were, you know, talk about this unless they watch the videos or listen to other podcasts. But like the heavy arrow thing, and we talked about this off air, the heavy arrow thing is obviously not a new thing, right? Trad archers that shoot port or for cedar arrows I mean, they're doing 700 grains. They're shooting a log. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And then those of us that started shooting aluminum arrows like I did, and anybody over the age of 40 really started shooting aluminum arrows, you were doing a 23, 15, 23, 17, 22, 19, something like that. That's like a 300 or 340 spine aluminum arrow. And you were shooting 11 grains per inch and 550 grains without even blinking. And you were blowing through deer, and you only had three broadhead options. You had an NAP Thunderhead, a Muzzy 125, or a Wasp. Those were like the three back of the day. And no one cared. No one got it. No one threw a hissy fit. And then carbon started, and it got lighter and faster because bows were real slow. I mean, a bow that I would 310 back in the day was like lightning fast, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know any of the, the numbers on it, my bows, but... So the first deer I got with archery was when I was 13 and man, that was crazy. Cause I can still, I mean, I know everything's slow motion in the moment and everything, but I could watch that arrow arc its way to that deer. <laughs> looks like a beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh but yeah. It, but I, but you remember, we all remember that. It was a low poundage, but it, yeah, that thing arced its way there and it hit and it did well. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's something that, you know, it's cool that it's, it's coming back, but now it's coming back with today's materials. So you're yeah. going into the carbon, higher FOC, the, the test kit, all that sort of stuff. So what carbon arrows are you going over to? I actually don't even know offhand. I went on okay. Lancaster Archery, I believe. Was, okay. I, I think I bought one 350 spine at, at Walmart. I just grabbed one off the shelf there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm at the point right now where I'm just trying to get one of each different kind and just mess around with it in the yard once i see what works then I'm, I'm fine spending the money but i'm trying to keep this as as minimal as possible while i mess around i don't want to spend 200 dollars testing <laughs> right and i couldn't agree more just to have a bunch of arrows that are the wrong spine and everything so yeah lancaster archery i found they'll sell arrows single single arrows so, yes by the shaft yeah yeah so i got two of those coming in a couple of days so i'm gonna start here checking these out and seeing what works in the yard and go with go from there and you've got the test kit from ethics did you go okay. with the one to two or the two to yep. three yep the one to two one to two okay yep <laughs> <laughs> but now um, you are you're probably you're you're what six foot six yeah. one so yep. you're probably in that 29 inch yeah. arrow or uh, draw length which means you're probably shooting about a 30 inch arrow, which means if you shot a 300 spine, right, you're probably already upping your total arrow weight in general, right? And this is what I kind of talk to people a lot. 
you know, I'm kind of a freak in the sense that I'm 31 inch draw shooting 60 pounds, a normal arrow weight for me with stock components is at least 450, if not 475. So it doesn't take much to bump me to five, 550. And I imagine you'll probably be in the same boat as well. But are you yeah. thinking of like going, you're going whole hog, you know, man <laughs> cert, 100, 150 grain insert, big broadhead, or are you just trying to just get closer to 500 a little bit easier? Um, yeah, I'm trying to just a little bit, just get the 500, 550, I think. But that's going to, we'll see where I get to when I start tinkering here with uh, right with the test kit and everything. But we like said, I didn't even know what these arrows were until I threw them on a scale. And these things with the broadheads are in the 465 to 470 already. So right, they don't have that much more to add. So we'll right. see. We'll see how and it I, goes. Yeah, and I just I was just looking up actually what the GPI of a 2213 is, and it's 9.8, so grains per inch of aluminum. And 9.8 is actually just a little bit over a typical 300 spine arrow. A typical 300 spine arrow is like 9.3 to 9.7. So actually you're right around where you usually would be with the, with the carbon arrow. And if you throw in, you know, 100 grains of brass and 125 grain point, you're going to be well over 500 grain. Um, and this is something that I try to tell people, and, and you're, of course, coming to the realization that it's not that hard. To, to up your momentum, to up your kinetic energy. You're not spent, you don't have to go out and buy a 300 grain broadhead. You can do something simple, a little bit slower. You make your bow, or I shouldn't say make your arrow slower, do it in a slower process. You don't have to go whole hog right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. My first thought with these was even, it might be as easy as just adding a hundred grain insert or so in the front, but then I don't know how these aluminums are going to work spine wise so they I, don't make 100 grain inserts for aluminum arrows yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I, that's, i'm still early in the, the testing and looking. oh yeah but <laughs> yeah that was at least my first thought i'm like well there's got to be something i can add something to, <laughs> to the front but <laughs> um with when it comes to the broadheads you know you're shooting the three blade right now the nap mm -hmm. thunderheads which have been t time tested for decades, those broadheads. But are you thinking of making a switch there as well? And are you thinking of, you know, completely going off the deep end and doing like single bevel type stuff? Or are you just like, nah, let's just, let's not go too, too fast, too quick here. I think, yeah, not too fast, too quick. And partially because I still have these broadheads. So I think for this year coming up, I'm just going to try some different arrows and different weights, different spines and different FOC and just see if anything else works and go from there. Um, I've had, I've also used the Rage, but I haven't had a chance to shoot one and edit animal yet, but I have some to, to shoot. And that's was a couple of years ago. That's just a couple of coworkers had some luck with them and I saw their results, but I don't know. I'm getting a little nervous about shooting those after seeing some of the stuff the last few months, but I know they still work, but I know yeah. there's a big, uh, big downside, but we'll see. When they work, they work. Yeah. I mean, it is undeniable when any mechanical hits where it needs to hit and works. Oh my gosh, they are devastating. And I will never tell somebody that mechanicals are useless or pointless because when they hit where yeah, they're the, supposed to, it's, it's the thing brutal. that stuck with me on the, that Troy talks about a lot is the, these high FOC heavy arrows or he calls them the plan B when stuff and things don't go as planned. I'm like, that's a good way to put it. Good way to look at it. <laughs> right. It's 100% is. And, you know, because I've told a couple people in, in other podcast episodes, and of course, all the time when people send me messages and stuff is when I shot, I shot fixed blades my entire life until about 2015, 2014. And I tried mechanicals because everybody was like, yeah, I shoot a mechanical. And so I like the over the top expandables mechanical. I don't like the rage version, just the backwards blade just kind of wigs me out. So I've always done the over the top. And I shot NAPs, which are really good over the top mechanicals. And the performance just wasn't there with quartering away shots in particular, because I aim for that offside shoulder joint. I aim for it. And when I, I shot a doe, 33 yards, actually the farthest shot I've ever taken at a whitetail, perfect shot on the entry. And it drove right into the scapula on the opposite, or just low a third of the scapula on the opposite side, stuck and did not pass through. And when I used to shoot fixed blades and aluminum arrows, that thing would just, would pop, blow right through that and exit right through the animal. 
Um, and thankfully I had a very easy recovery and everything, but that, that took me back. I was like, that was, that was plan a, that it was going to go through. And when plan B needed to take effect, it did not happen. And so I, I made the switch back to fixed plays and, and I won't look back. Um, so I think that's good. I, I like that, that perspective. Yeah, I think I'm I'm switching back this year. I think last year I carried five arrows out, and I think two of them were still the fixed blades. <laughs> so yeah, I never quite got rid of them. <laughs> well, Andrew, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. It has been an absolute pleasure talking with a fellow Keystone State native, talking everything about Pennsylvania archery, getting into the heavier arrow setup, shooting older equipment, even though it might be a little outdated. It does not mean it does not work. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, bud. Well, thanks for giving the opportunity. It's uh, I love the podcast idea and love getting everybody involved. I'm excited to see all the people across the country and what everyone has to say here. I think it's going to be a blast. And if you are successful with that thing, that bow, that high country, I want a picture so I can post it on social media to prove that a 20-year-old compound Hopefully I'll be sending one here. It works, baby. All right. Well, folks at home, once again, if you would like to be on the podcast or a part of the Average Jack Archery YouTube in general, please send an email to AverageJackArchery at gmail.com. Also find me on social media, Average Jack Archery, Facebook, Instagram. Leave a comment on YouTube. Hope you're able to get outside, enjoy the sport of archery, archery hunting if you so choose. Definitely enjoy God's beautiful creation, and we'll get to see you next time.